Welcome to another edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're going through the book of John, the Gospel of John, and we come today to John chapter 16, verse 1. You can study the Bible with me in its entirety at your pace, at your convenience, at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. All you need for Bible study is there at thebibleversebyverse.com because you can study all 31,000 plus verses, all 66 books of the Bible, in-depth Bible study, verse by verse, four series. Three of them are complete, the fourth one almost complete, and you choose, click, and listen. And all you need to bring is your Bible to the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And I hope you have your Bible ready right now and opened to the Gospel of John chapter 16. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is talking to his apostles this is the night in which he was betrayed, Holy Thursday. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended or caused to stumble. Jesus is saying, the things that I've been saying to you this evening, I'm saying, because bad times are coming. And when the bad times come, you'll know that I knew ahead of time that it didn't catch me by surprise, that I was not taken off guard, that I was guard, that I was no man's victim. So you won't give up on me. The best reason to be in the world during the good times is the best reason to be in the word during good times not in the world but in the word the best reason to study the word be in the word read the word during good times is so that you will have a reservoir of strength to carry you through the bad times that are inevitable Two, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Jesus says that tremendous times of persecution are coming. So it's going to get bad. And then... When that happens, it will happen because the people's minds are going to be so twisted because of their sin and rebellion against God. So twisted because they're so caught up in their religion and not in the written word of God like they should be. Their minds are going to be so twisted that some of the persecutors of God's people will think, I'm going to kill an apostle and I'm going to make God happy by doing it. I'm going to kill a Christian, and God is going to pat me on the back and say, good job. That's the way it is. A lot of religious people, over the years, over the church age, some of the greatest persecutors of true Christians who love Jesus and love the Word of God, some of the greatest persecutors of holy men who proclaim the Word of God without compromise, some of their greatest persecutors were so-called Christian people. Very religious. Very religious, very lukewarm, very establishment, and very far from the Word of God. And they didn't like it when a man came along and preached the pure truth because it put them in their place for their lukewarmness. It's been that way throughout church history. 
The church establishment many times has grown cold, has grown lukewarm, and just very religious, but very cold toward God and very ignorant of the Word of God. And they don't like being told that they need to repent. That's the way it was with Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. That's the way it was with the apostles after Jesus went into heaven and the religious leaders of their day. And that's the way it's been. You know, some of the great revivals that have happened in the English-speaking world, and there's been, whatever it was, three, three great revivals, yes. They've all been under the King James Version, by the way, since, since the new translations, the perverted, twisted text translations came out. There hasn't been, there has not been a worldwide revival in among English-speaking people. That's because we don't even have the written word of God if you don't, re, if you're not using the King James based on the received text or a slight update. It's true. But it's amazing to me that if you study church history, the great preachers who were anointed by God and filled with the Holy Spirit and were used in these revivals were not welcomed in the establishment churches. No, they weren't welcome. They weren't invited, and, they, and, and if they were invited, they weren't invited back. So they had to go out and preach on their own, set up a tent someplace or whatever, preach out in the field. Today, fortunately, we have radio and internet because I'm certainly not welcome in those churches. I'm not comparing myself with the great revivalist preachers that were responsible for the for the uh, great spiritual awakenings in the English-speaking world. Now, I'm not comparing myself to them. But I do know that I'm different, and you do too. You know I'm different than your preacher, the church you used to go to, and you can't stomach it anymore. You know I'm different. That's why you're listening to me. That's why you're watching me. And that's why I used to get invited to their churches when I was a part of their denomination many, many years ago, but I was never invited back. And of course, I'll just wear that as a badge of honor because I wouldn't want to be welcomed by those folks any more than, than the, the revivalists of the, of the past would want to be welcomed by the establishment religion of their days. Why? That, all that meant was that you were compromising like they were. But Jesus warns us, you know what? The religious people are going to give you a hard time. They're going to kill you, and they're going to actually think that they're doing God a favor. That's how twisted and far gone they are and far removed they are from the written word of God. It's happening today. Many of you know that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Three. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. They don't even know me, that's why. Religious to the max, but they don't know me. Period. And by the way, anytime you suffer any kind of persecution for the sake of Jesus Christ, then just remember that you are not the real target. This is a spiritual battle. It is a battle between the devil and God and the world's hostility against Christians is in reality against the God who they know that you serve and they're not comfortable with. You shake them up too much when you live holy. You shake them up too much when you proclaim the pure word of God and they don't like it. They want their comfortable little religions. That's all they want. A little taste of religiosity is all they can stomach because they love the world so much. So they can't stand you and they can't stand me. And that's too bad. Not for me, not for you, but for them. Too bad for them. Because they're going to lose that fight. The fight's not ours, it's God's and they're going to lose that fight. Verse 4, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. 
And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. We may not always realize it, but God does work to prepare us for what is coming in our future. We may wonder why things happen the way they do. They just don't seem to make sense at the time. Oftentimes, it is God preparing us for something that will happen in the future. And the things that God is trying to teach you right now, the things that you are hopefully learning right now, you need to learn because of something that's going to happen to you in the future. So just go with it and walk with God and trust Him. Five. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Where goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Jesus had been talking about going away and the disciples not being able to go with him right now. And because of this, the disciples let sorrow fill their hearts which is very dangerous. You don't want to let sorrow fill your heart if you're a Christian. You don't need to because you have the written word of God and you have the promise of the future. You have fellowship with Jesus. So it's not that you can't feel sad. Just don't let it fill your heart. You don't want to let sorrows fill your heart. And it's important to not let disappointment cause sorrow to fill your heart either. Disappointments are going to come. And we're all going to have them. But when sorrow fills your heart, then it will drain you of the spiritual strength that you need. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. So when disappointment comes your way, lift the shield of faith. Stand on the word of Almighty God and quote scripture that God says is going to use this terrible thing that's happening to you to bring about good and stand on that word and believe it. So that way, faith will fill your heart and not sorrow. I'm not going to say you're bubbling over with happiness, but sorrow will not fill your heart. If you stay in the word and claim the promises of God, you may still be sad, because of the circumstances, but it's not going to fill your heart. Faith will move in and fill your heart and keep you from drowning in sorrows and becoming so weak and useless to God that he can't even use you. Seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Jesus, right away, tells his apostles that the fact that he's going away is good news disguised as bad news. For a Christian who loves God, all bad news is good news, simply disguised as bad news, because God is working all things together for our good. You see that? So even when we get bad news, it's actually good news disguised as bad news because God's going to use it to bring about good. doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's just a fact. So Jesus gets specific because when Jesus returns, when he returned to heaven after, after he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit from the throne of God to live in believers. So, they were much better off with Jesus returning to heaven. Because if he doesn't return to heaven, like he's saying in these verses, if he doesn't return to heaven, if he doesn't go to the throne of God, then he doesn't send the Holy Spirit back to live inside his people. And I know it would be great to live and walk with Jesus and see him face to face. The apostles, that was great for them for three plus years. But actually, it is better to have the Holy Spirit inside of us as Christians than to have Jesus just confined to his one body, living in one spot. 
8. And when he has come, that's the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit is going to have a ministry for the unsaved. The Holy Spirit ministers to Christians in many ways. His ministry to the unsaved is very simple, narrow, and direct, which is that he convicts them of their sin and of their need for a Savior. Look at 9. Of sin because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit convicts the unsaved people of the world concerning many sins, but the big sin that the Holy Spirit will convict them of is the sin of rejecting Christ. The Holy Spirit concentrates on the sin of refusing to repent and receive Christ as Lord and Savior because that's the one sin that will ultimately send a person to hell if they don't repent of it. It's the most serious sin that there is because it slams the door on salvation. You can get saved if, if you commit other sins, if you repent and re receive Christ as Lord and Savior. But if you persist in, in rejecting Christ, that's the worst sin in the world. Because there's no salvation if you do that one. There's no salvation for that sin if you, re if you don't repent. So, what's the, what's the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Jesus' death on the cross made it possible for lost sinners to be righteous in the presence of God. Jesus finished the work of redemption on the cross. And then he went back home to the Father after he finished that work. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convince lost sinners that the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the righteous Christ, paid for sins on the cross through his death. And that, that that's the only righteousness that you will ever need. That's the only righteousness that will ever get you into heaven. And you get it by receiving him. So the Holy Spirit job, job, ministry to the unsaved is to convict them of sin, especially the sin of rejecting Christ, and also to convict them of their need for Jesus Christ and the righteousness that he alone provides. Only the Holy Spirit can convince a lost sinner that these things are true. But he's not done. Of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The prince of this world is Satan. And Jesus says that Satan is judged. Jesus says that Satan is condemned. He's a loser. Satan has been tried, convicted, and sentenced to eternal hell fire because he did not submit to God. And so he is going to hell. Satan is the father of lies and the damning of the devil himself to hell means that people who will not repent and receive Christ will then be damned as well. And there's no hope for you because if the devil who rejected Almighty God and Jesus Christ who walked away from them even when he was in heaven, made his choice, is condemned to hell, and he's as strong as he is. Satan was the most powerful being God ever created, and if God is sending him to hell because of his sin, you don't have a chance, mister, if you reject Christ. And so this is why the word of God needs to be proclaimed. That when you're talking to lost sinners, when you're preaching to lost sinners, you got to preach against sin. You got to preach against sin. You got to call sin for what it is, sin. 
and not water it down, not call it dysfunction, not call it behavior disorder. The Holy Spirit convinces, convicts people, lost sinners of sin. All sins, including the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So if you don't have the guts to stand up, preacher, and proclaim sin and call it what it is, you can forget about being used by God to win lost souls to heaven and to keep them out of hell because you've just thrown away your only hope of being used by God to do that because you're too cowardly and you're too concerned about being popular yourself, you useless piece of human trash disguised as a preacher. If the word of God is not proclaimed clearly, the world, the lost world on the way to hell will not be convinced of sin and shame on you for not doing it. And if the word of God is not proclaimed clearly and God's standards are not proclaimed clearly right from the word of God, then the world on the way to hell will never be convicted of the fact that they need the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ because their measure of righteousness, whatever it might be, doesn't cut it with God. And so they need Jesus. There's no hope without Jesus. And if the word of God is not proclaimed clearly without watering it down, then the lost sinners of this world who are on their way to hell won't understand that the devil himself is going to hell. And if he's going to hell, they're going to hell. And that's why the word of God needs to be proclaimed so clearly. And that is why it is such, it is so disgraceful for preachers to water down the word of God. And if you think you're getting away with that, you are out of your ever-loving mind. You are not. And you people who support those kind of preachers, if you think that you're getting away with that, you are out of your mind. And you're all going to find out someday. And someday is going to be too late if it's after you're dead. Because you're going to die. And then you will know. The Word of God has to be proclaimed clearly. Because the Holy Spirit works through the pure, simple, straightforward Word of God to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I had a modern evangelical tell me, I don't think you should talk about hell. I don't think you should talk about judgment and punishment when you talk to the unsaved. This, this, is, this is the mindset of modern evangelicals, okay? This is, this is just a sample of what you will hear among those people. Don't talk about sin. Don't point out sin. Don't call it by name. Don't talk about hell. Don't talk about judgment. Just talk about the love of God. If all you do is talk about the love of God, then people will get saved. And I remember telling this person, I said, you are wrong. That works for Christians. Sure, that works for Christians. You tell Christians who are already saved about the love of God. That's why I teach the Bible. Because when you study the whole Bible, you get a, a, a full picture of God. And a lot of it is just the God of love. And when a Christian studies the word of God, they see how much God loves them. And it just inspires them to want to live for him more. Why? Because they're saved. Because they already have the spirit of God in them. So yeah, when you're talking about Christians, you talk about the love of God and his kindness. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. But when you're talking about the unsaved, it doesn't work to, to talk just about the love of God you can talk about the love of God and the fact that he sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins, but you also got to talk about the fact that you are a sinner and you're hell bound and you need the righteousness of Christ because that's what convicts people and gets them saved. Jesus just said it. He just said it. And that idiot, so-called evangelist, Southern Baptist, years ago when I was first saved, 40 years ago, so young and stupid, I didn't know any better. I was just saved for probably a year, maybe, at the most. He came to church where I was going, and 
he did a seminar on soul winning, and I told you this before. He said, if you want to be a soul winner for Christ, then you need to enroll in a salesmanship class at the local tech. And he was dead serious. And I was young and stupid, and I even knew how foolish that was. This guy was clueless when it came to the work of salvation and how people really get saved. All he had to do was listen to Jesus, and then you would know, and he would have known, that you have to proclaim the pure word of God without watering it down. And then the Holy Spirit will take that word and convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to the unsaved world. See? The work of the Holy Spirit to you and I as Christians is different. The work of the Holy Spirit to you and I who are saved is to comfort us, is to teach us, is to strengthen our faith, is to increase our love for Jesus Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit in you and I who are saved is to convict us when we commit a sin, make us feel bad so that we will repent. But it's also to make us feel good and to have joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and meekness and faithfulness and self-control. The Holy Spirit produces all of these things inside of Christians. And it comes again when we are in the Word of God. Always remember this. The Holy Spirit works in unison with the Holy Word of God. But when preachers water down the Word of God, I don't care if they're talking to the unsaved. The unsaved aren't going to get saved. If you water down the Word of God, preacher, the unsaved aren't going to get saved. If you water down the Word of God, preacher, then those people that just happen to listen to you will not be blessed. They will not be fed. They will not be drawn closer to Christ. They will not be convicted of the sin that they are guilty of so that they can confess it and repent of it and draw even closer to Christ and have an even more joy. See, it all comes from proclaiming the pure word of God without watering it down. That's what's absolutely necessary. That's why you have no business Supporting a minister that waters down the Word of God, that majors in entertainment, trying to be cute, trying to be intellectual, trying to use big words that no one, no one understands so that people are impressed. See, at least that way you can have them come back to you and listen to you if they happen to be enamored with stuff like that. They're not coming back because they're being fed. They're coming back because, wow, that guy's smart. At least I think he is. I don't know what he said. I told you the story of a pastor that I had. Again, back when I was real young in the Lord, maybe maybe saved a year. He, all he did was entertain. I was too stupid to realize what he was doing. But I realized after a couple of months, all he was doing was entertaining and telling stories. Oh, he had people laughing and having a good time. But I, walked, I left church. Every single Sunday, I left church starving to death because I was never fed. And I went up to him. I, I made an appointment with him. I met him in his home. I said, and I was perfectly sincere. I wasn't trying to be a wise guy because I figured this guy's a pastor. He must know about teaching the Bible. So I said, pastor, do you know, have you ever heard of expository preaching, teaching the word of God? He said, oh, yes, Mike. Yes, I, yes, I know about that. But I find most people come to church to be entertained and not to be taught. Oh, so that's what you give them. Rather than telling them what God wants them to know, you tell them what makes them feel good. You snake. And I left. And I never came back. If you would like to be a part of this ministry, you can be. Very simple. Pray for me. Pray for the Word of God. When you take a break from studying with me verse by verse at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I would appreciate it if you believe in the straight word of God that I have been teaching for over 34 years and you want to help me get it out and you want to stand shoulder to shoulder with me, we are doing something that we know God approves of. That's how you can do it.
and that would be wonderful. And I'm out of time. Until next time. So long, everyone.